So first, let me thank this guy right here. Not often do you have uh, a community college president that says like, bring me your felons. I want them on my campus. Um, and so when you find someone with that type of heart and wanting to work with uh, this population, um, you got to grab them and stay very close. So uh, thank you to uh, San Diego City College and the San Diego Foundation. Thank you. Um, yeah. So I, I came in this and didn't expect, uh, uh, I didn't expect this path at all. Um, I, uh, I, I, I produced the Hangover films. I apologize to anyone if I, we offended you um, in advance. Uh, but I, I was actually on a, doing a movie called Old School. Um, and a fellow producer on that film uh, asked me if I wanted to come be a guest speaker in his creative writing class in the local juvenile hall. And that was in 2004. And um, the, the quick version of the story is I went in and sat at a table with 14, 15, 16 year olds who were facing life in prison. And as you went around the table and you started talking to th these kids, um, you realized that before victimizing somebody, they had been through just atrocities you would never wish on any child. Foster care, no fathers, physical sexual abuse, on and on and on and on, and all of that added up together. So uh, trying to understand why a young kid who, have been, who, who has been through all that would run out into the streets and look for some love uh, or something that looked like love uh, from gang members or men uh, hanging out in the streets wasn't very confusing to me. I got it, and I got it right away. Um, I also got that these were children and they had the ability to change, and they wanted to change, and the kid sitting next to me had just gotten sentenced at 15 years old to 300 years in prison um, for standing next to the shooter. So he didn't even touch the gun. And he's going off, David Negretti's going off for 300 years. And on the other side of me was Adam Avila who looked 11 years old and was going to prison for six years uh, for his part in a robbery. Um, and Adam Avila, who went to prison for six years, ended up coming back and he was my prop assistant on The Hangover. And he's now in the union and he now works on films 24 seven and is now making almost more money than I am running a nonprofit. Um, <clears throat> but uh, it was that moment where I realized that I'm not a person and we're not a country um, that should allow children to be sent away for this period of time. And that this, is, this sentence, <clears throat> these life sentences of life without parole, 300 years, are basically telling a child that we don't believe you have any ability to change. And I knew right away that that wasn't true. And after 12 years of doing this, it's 100% untrue. Um, and, and we are the only country in the world other than Somalia that sentences kids to die in prison. So that sent me out on a, on a crazy journey. I, right away I went into prisons and started working, uh, expanding and starting college programs in the adult system. So these young kids that I was working with when they went into an adult prison had a safe group of people rather than when they entered saying, okay, uh, hold this knife or here's some drugs or whatever other things happen in prison. The conversation was, here's a book, do you wanna go to college? And to this day we have 8,000 inmates in California prisons that are college students, and every piece of research shows that it reduces recidivism by half or more. Um, so I really felt that education was, was a huge equalizer, but also kind of an identity shifter, and how these young people saw themselves, felt about themselves, and we just saw incredible success. Um, <coughs> and so um, I had a student in juvenile hall named uh, Prophet Walker. And Prophet was 16 years old, never been arrested before, and he was going to prison for eight years for a robbery uh, that he and a friend committed on a train. And uh, when Prophet got to prison at 18 years old, he immediately enrolled in the college program, got his AA degree, and when he was sitting in his prison dorm, he got his acceptance letter to the Loyola Marymount School of Science and Engineering because he wanted to be an engineer, got accepted. And in that moment that Prophet got accepted, you saw that in that college dorm of 100 men who were all in college in that Prophet's dorm, that 
community college now was not the end of the road. That if Profit got accepted into a four-year university, then that's now the path we're all gonna follow. So everyone was in there doing community college and transferring to universities. And I saw many of them coming out, coming back into the community, and they were spread all over LA, Orange, Riverside, San Bernardino counties. So we started doing retreats where we'd bring them all together on a weekend, and we would do kind of academic counseling, yoga, meditation, sports, swim in the ocean, et cetera. We even did a retreat down here in San Diego, and that was sort of the beginning uh, of how the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, ARC, was formed. Uh, we started off with about 35 members. Today, we're at 270 members. Uh, to become a member of ARC, you need to be formally incarcerated, and you need to sign a commitment to strive to be crime-free, gang-free, drug-free, in school or working, and willing to be of service to the community. And what I really wanted to do was, I was so troubled by the narrative we see on TV and the narrative that my business um, puts out there in terms of who these youth are. And I felt like if we're gonna turn on the news every night and see this shooting and this crime, that we need to turn the news and see uh, the stories of Prophet Walker or Walter McMillan who left prison and is now a radiologist at UC Irvine, uh, or Beto or Cerise or Jay, that these are the stories that we need to start putting out there and figuring out how to show the strength of the men and women and the, and the boys and girls that we love, not just keep perpetuating their weaknesses. Um, and so half of what we do is when someone comes out of juvenile hall or jail or prison, uh, is bring them in and figure out what type of services they need. Um, and whether it's housing, whether it's uh, employment, whether it's connections to college, whether it's therapy, we're there to do that. The other thing we do is we really believe that the folks who have experienced this um, the folks that are on the stage with me today uh, are the real experts. And it's their stories that are gonna change law and policy. So we came in at the tail end of a bill in Sacramento called SB9, which was to now put us ahead of Somalia and not sentence kids to die in prison. And this bill for seven years in a row had died in the state assembly because there were 12 Democrats that didn't wanna look soft on crime. And two votes shy, and all it took was coming up for one day with five formerly incarcerated folks and sitting down with those 12 holdouts. We ended up getting the final two votes, the bill passed, and it's now the law. So now it's illegal in the state of California to sentence anybody to life without the possibility of parole for a crime they committed as a child. Um, and that reform, <laughs> that reform was led by the stories of the formerly incarcerated. The next year we did SB, Senate Bill 260 which was again led by a campaign of 60 formerly incarcerated folks, but this time they spoke to the Republicans, they spoke to the moderate Democrats, and got about 20 legislators who in their careers had never voted for criminal justice reform, but because of personal stories of this is who I was when I was 14, this is how I changed my life, and this is what I'm doing now, we got those 20 folks to change the way they thought about the formerly incarcerated, and ended up passing this bill uh, with nine Republican votes, um, and uh, this bill helped 4,500 people in prison who committed crimes as juveniles and got life sentences. Um, and so it's been an incredible, we've now passed five bills that the governor signed, all with the advocacy um, of, of the ARC team. And let me put it in perspective, and I'll end with this. Um, so it costs $65,000 to incarcerate one adult in California. It costs $225,000 to incarcerate one juvenile. 225. So you could send them to Harvard five times for what it costs to lock them up for one year. <coughs> Recidivism for this juvenile population is 71%. So if I was the CEO of a company that made a product that cost $225,000 to manufacture, and I sold it to you, and seven out of 10 times it was a dud, I would be fired and the damn company would be bankrupt. But we have a system that continues to do this and ruin lives and create more victims and ruin public safety and we continue to make this investment. When we know, and the data shows, very simply, small investments we can make in the community that cuts this in half. 
And the data is clear. Like, this is not difficult. What it tells us is you provide somebody with stable, stable housing, you reduce recidivism. You provide somebody with a mentor, just simply someone in your life that's there for you 24 seven through your struggles, through your accomplishments, reduces recidivism in a huge way. Connect them to education, job training, workforce, job, even more reduced. If they need therapy, provide it because this is a population that's experienced severe trauma before prison, in the community, in prison, et cetera. And these things reduce recidivism by 70%. But the problem is we have this whole tough on crime rhetoric um, because it's not, and, and the crazy part is on SB 260, my first letter of support was from Newt Gingrich. The second letter of support was from Grover Norquist. The third letter of support was from Rand Paul. The fourth letter of support were from the Koch brothers, along with the ACLU and the Catholic Church and, the, and, and every other church on the planet. And it's become the only bipartisan issue in Washington, D.C. because people understand we're wasting money, we're wasting human lives, and people across all, across all political parties and all religious beliefs believe in redemption and second chances. So there's never been a time um, in probably any of our lifetimes where we have the momentum now to do the right thing. Because if you're talking about a 66% recidivism rate in San Diego, that means almost seven out of 10 people are coming out of prison and hurting someone else. So even if your lens is purely a public safety lens, then we're failing there too. The public is less safe because we're investing in all the wrong things. Um, so I look forward to a very lively discussion. Um, I've ho I hope I've set the table in the right way. Um, and you're about to hear from three unbelievable people um, that have blown my mind and I hope will blow your mind. So let me turn it back to President Beebe. Thank you. Scott, thank you so much. You are such an inspiration. Yes, please give it up for him. He is such an inspiration and he's just so hard to get going on stuff. He doesn't have, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's just totally amazing. I'll calm down now. Yeah, Thanks. just totally amazing. You're such a leader with this whole thing, both statewide, nationwide, and it's just, I'm thrilled that you're here and, and you really did set the table for us.